Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Dungeon Crawl. I might sound a little different. I definitely look different if you're watching me on the old wonderful YouTube channel. Uh, I'm in our old place where we used to record in my apartment. Braxton is feeling extremely under the weather. Um, so wish him the best of luck. I wouldn't comment down below uh, or send us a tweet or you know whatever. Everything's in the link tree if you want to do that. Uh, hop on our Discord to wish Braxton the best of luck. He, he's not feeling very good. Um, I'm sure he'll be fine, but we're going to keep an eye on him and make sure everything's okay. It's not COVID, don't worry. Um, we were going to be covering Nether Deep this week, but as you can see, uh, that's not the case. Um, it's a great book. Anyway, I'm very excited to talk about it. We'll be doing that next week now. And we were actually going to get Kenneth involved, our good friend Kenneth. And now he might be able to join us, possibly. No promises. We'll see. Um, so instead... While I was cleaning, I was actually doing some cleaning a little bit ago. That's how my week has been. I'll let you guys know what my week's been. It's usually how we start these things. Uh, my, I've been cleaning like crazy. I have this new fancy bookshelf behind me. If you remember last time we were in this setup, it did not look this nice. Uh, and so I got this new bookshelf and decided that would be a great time to clean literally everything in this room, in this uh, streaming recording area. So I scrapped everything that I have up in this closet to my right. And I found some old D&D &D notes from the very first session I ever ran. And it, it brought back some memories. Because when I first started, okay, when I first started playing D&D, &D, I, I was watching Critical Role, right? It's a great starting point. So watching Critical Role and I saw what this could bring, what D&D &D could bring, like story-wise and telling. And then the, the beauty that this, I guess, tabletop RPGs in general, not just D&D, &D, uh, has... The possibilities literally are endless. And I've always been a fan of storytelling writing. I almost went to school to be a filmmaker, to be a, a, a script writer and all that jazz. I did, uh, I've written a few scripts in my time and they, they won a few awards here and there, a couple of, of film festivals. So that was fun. Um, but that's I'm not here to talk about that. Uh, so I, I saw that and I was like, I want to do, this is what I want to do. I could do that, right? Possibly, maybe, probably not. No, I can't be Matthew Mercer. Uh, I didn't have the Matthew Mercer effect. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. That's, oh, that's a whole other shtick. So I picked up the starter set. I thought this was a great start. I picked up this lovely box here. Look at this. The starter set. I have it in the flesh. Uh, it was... I don't remember how much it was, but it was a great little product I got from probably like Barnes & Noble or some some stuff. Um, it's a classic. You know, it's got The Lost Minds of Fandelver. Here we go. Look at this lovely, lovely book. Uh, it's about, what, like 50, 50 pages? It's pretty short. I believe it takes the characters from like first to third level. Uh, something like that. It comes with, which is this why it's a great starter set. It comes with uh, character sheets already pre-made, pre-built, so you can just bring some friends over, hand them the sheet, and then dive in and figure it all out together if you so wish. It's a lot of really great little gems in here. I love the Nothic, some beautiful stuff. I don't want to you know, spoil it if you haven't played it yet. Um, but it comes with this big pamphlet, as you can see here, and it was extremely intimidating to me when I first played. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's funny looking at this now. It's like, like I said, 50 pages. That is chump change. Call of the Nether Deep is like 246 pages. Some of the books behind me here are bigger than that. So this was, uh, very scary for me though. When I, when I first delved into it, it was tough for me to, dive back and forth between the like the organization here between the the kind of open world sections of the, the village and then diving back to the mine and into the dungeons underneath stuff it was a lot to take in and i was really nervous and this actually happened i was really nervous when players would ask me questions and i would say the wrong answer because i didn't know and i'd have to dive into the book and spend like 20 minutes trying to find the correct answer because i felt like it was someone else's story Right. And I, I don't want to mess up their story. This is their adventure. They created it. And I got to tell it correct. This is before, you know, I, I DM'd Logger. I was like, Who, this is my story. It's not your story. That's the, I think that's the correct frame of reference you should have. Um, so I, I put up all these little things here. This was the smart thing that I did. Uh, for my audio listeners out there, this is a uh, little like tags that I put out. So this one says in. Let's see if it takes us to the end. Uh, it does. Does it? Oh, it did over here. Yes, Stonehill Inn. Okay, uh, this one takes me to Barthen Manor or Barthen Mine. Sorry, uh, uh, the Orchard and Lion. 
the light wrote on it? Lion. Uh, for the Lion Shield Coaster. Makes sense. Uh, Coaster. I don't know how to pronounce that. So this helped me a lot. Um, but still, I didn't... I didn't like that I didn't know everything. And I felt like I needed to know everything to run this. God help me when I got the Curse of Stroud, which was the next book I picked up. Because that's... that's the organization of that book is really, really rough to get into for especially a new DM. So I feel like I needed to know everything in this book. So this is, I did, this is what I did. I wrote everything. I wrote absolutely everything down. And yes, I mean everything. Um, so the book was then, the adventure, I should say, was written down twice. Once in the, the pamphlet that it came with and once in my own paper notes, which is the things that I found here. If you're on uh, the video, you can see them. Audio, uh, I will just describe them to you the best I can. These are written in pencil on like college ruled, wide ruled kind of pages here. Uh, I, I wrote down what level things are. Uh, so like, I think that's what this is, six? No, G, oh, okay, this is even better. I should have, uh, I understand now my own handwriting. Uh, so the guy's name is Gundren, right? So I abbreviated it to G. So every now, from now on out, G means Gundren. So right here it says the wagon belongs to G and S. Gundren and Sildar. I cannot emphasize this enough that I wrote the entire thing down. You can see it here. Um, now, to be fair, I did trim some things. I, I took out what I didn't believe to be crucial information. And it was in my own hand. So I, I you know, would reword things, reorganize it. Um... I, I reorganized it reorganize to what I believed the players would encounter first. And then from where they would go from there. And I, I, I tried to organize it in a way that made more sense to me. And this helped out. This did. This made, made it easier for me to run the mine of Fandelver. Um, I even added <laughs> the exact same tabs to this section as well. We have the inn, which you would imagine takes us to the inn. Yeah, part two, Stonehill Inn. Beautiful. Uh, Sildar gets to stay for a night. I, I, I described this character as short, friendly. They're a native of Tribor. So as you can see, I went into detail here. Now, the problem with this, it made it extremely cluttered and nearly impossible to read. Uh, I can hardly read them today. These, the, the curse of handwriting here, it looks like the scrawlings of a madman. Some things are starred. God knows why they're starred. I guess because it's important things that I don't want to miss. Uh, I wrote down how far things are, 100 miles. I want to make sure I had all the information available to me without having to pull out the pamphlet. This means I have to pull out this gigantic wad of notes and find it in here instead. So what I thought was going to be helpful ended up leading to a valuable waste of time. Uh, I, I remember I would have the, the pamphlet in front of me. On the on like the table, and then I had a pencil and this paper in front of me, literally like I was taking notes for a class. And granted, I was in my freshman year of college for this, or no, sophomore year of college when I was doing this. So maybe it was just this was comfortable to me that I felt like I got to write notes for everything in my entire life. <laughs> uh, luckily, that's not the case. Um, but so uh, this leads me to talking about notes, I guess, in a more broad sense. Um, while I thought it was going to help my game, ended up making it worse. Because you could, the time I was spending on this crap, I could very easily have been putting it into something else that would be more valuable to my players and to myself. Because notes really are your your single most important tool as a DM to bring to the table, at least, at least in my opinion, right? I, I don't think, as an improv DM, I don't think you need notes like this, of course. This is not improv. This is like, you've got it all planned out, baby. Improv, I think you would need a few other things here and there, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So your notes would look different. But notes are still important for a DM's period. I mean, like I said, even as an improv, you might need a bullet point list of things you want to try to hit during this session. Regardless, the notes should enhance your tabletop RPG experience, not make it worse. Whether you're running homebrew, whether you're doing a pre-written adventure, because my homebrew notes look very different than if I'm running an adventure like this. I also, I do want to point this out. I did make some sick ass maps. Uh, I apologize for my audio listeners, uh, but you're gonna have to turn turn to the YouTube for these these beauties. Look at that, huh? That's a cave. Then we got uh, actually, there's, if you you can't see, it, it's really dark. There's some shackles up there. I think that's where they were keeping some wolves, the goblins. That is. Uh, then we got another cave with some 
bedrolls. That is beautiful. These are all made in Photoshop, I think. Uh, then we got this is my this is my favorite here. This is where you fight some goblins and a hobgoblin, I think, in this area. And you got uh, you got some rocks. Those were fun to make uh, with some with like a little lake and more cave. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Work. They were not half bad. Okay, so that that's that's time well spent, at least in my mind. So nowadays I don't do this anymore. That's that that's way too much time. I don't have that, I don't have that that free time anymore. So I have moved my notes entirely to writing them on a program called OneNote. This OneNote program is, I don't think it's on Apple. It is on at least the iPad. I don't know if it's on Macs. Uh, I would imagine at least some version of it. It's a, it's a Windows product, Microsoft, I should say. Uh, there are a few templates to allow you to get into the D&D OneNote experience a little easier. Uh, I use one by someone named CryRid. At least that's where I started. I've, I've definitely shifted and morphed it a little bit since then. Uh, but that, that's a great starting point. I definitely recommend picking up one of these templates because that is by far the hardest process is setting everything up. Because the, the template that I downloaded had a bunch of the spells. All the ones in the SRD spells were already up there. A good chunk of, uh, um, not Curse of Stroud. I think Curse of Stroud might have been a little bit in there. Um, but there, there, there was an example adventure, which was the house at the beginning of Curse of Stroud or the, uh, the pre Adventure, the one shot before Curse of Stroud, House of Death, I think is what it's called. Um, some basic D&D lore, some mechanics. And the, the, what, the reason why I like OneNote so much is because it allows you to search the entire thing. So if someone asks you, hey, what is Lay on Hands do? You can type in Lay on Hands and boom. It'll, it's like D&D Beyond before D&D Beyond existed. And I personally, I think it runs better than D&D Beyond. So, but hey, D&D Beyond, you're getting better. You're definitely getting a lot better. And I appreciate the work that those people are putting into that. Uh, the other reasons why I like uh, it so much is it does, like what I said, what D&D Beyond does. If you open up a book and you know, there are links on D&D Beyond, you can do that in OneNote as well. So if you, for example, have a stat block for a creature up and it has a spell on the description page, you can click it on the stat block if you've linked the pages. And it'll take you straight to that spell. You can read the spell, figure out what you got to do, then hit the back button and go right back to the stat block and keep going. You can also, you can link, I mean, you link to everything. So there's going to be a link in here. You can find an important name that you have that links to a lore description. So you can click that name, link to the lore description. And this allows you to clear up their page a little bit easier. So it's not as cluttered, which is my notes before. Very cluttered. So I, I would have saved me a lot of trouble. Uh, I'll try to pop up a few examples on the video. Sorry for the audio listeners. You won't be able to see this as much, um, but I'm trying to describe as much as I can. So uh, the possibilities for that are endless. It's still a, a bit of a mess, but it's a more helpful mess for me. I have some important things bolded. I got some maps for, for dungeons right next to the description. So it makes it a lot easier instead of flopping back and forth between a dungeon and a, and a description map. I found an organizational pattern that works well for me. And I think that's the that's the crux of this. It's the core of what I'm getting at. Do you have to use OneNote? Hell no. You don't have to use OneNote. It's not a it's a free program, so I recommend trying it. Actually, I think it's, it might not be free. I think it's free. If you have Microsoft Office, it's definitely free, but I think you can get it on most things. Um, now, you don't have to use OneNote. Like I'm saying, OneNote's not a priority. It's not a, a crucial thing. You can use other programs, or you can even you know do it all, all handwritten. What I'm trying to say, though, is find an organization that works for you. Because this has elevated my games, I think, tenfold. I mean, if Braxton were here, he would tell you. Insert Braxton's voice saying, yes, this has really helped the games. They, they are so much more fun, Brian. Um, so for improv DMs, I think what you would need is quick access to stat blocks. I think this is an important detail. Because uh, if you're improv and and the, the players come across some creature that you improv off, all of a sudden they ran off into the middle of nowhere. There's a goblin party. Make sure you have those goblin stat blocks on hand, easy to go. Uh, random tables, I think, are good. Names are something I think everyone should have, every DM. Uh, I do have uh, my DM binder here as well. Um, we did an episode a while back talking about the importance of a DM binder, and I've been wanting to make a full video on DM binders. I think they're extremely handy not just for improv dms but for everybody i use this thing a lot um it has you know all sorts of different roll tables in here you can't really see it well but i promise i'll make a full video on this so i'll have some better shots and some better uh, uh diagrams for for all this jazz um but making your own dm binder is also important because you input what you think is important what you deem important for your game 
Um, also, on your DM screen here, on your DM screen, uh, if you play in person, that is, uh, it has lots of beautiful, important things on it. This is a, another template that I have downloaded and taken. I wish if I could find it, I'll put it in the description. Uh, but I've also modified it to put what I deem is more most important for, for my uses. Um, but these DM screens have stuff like what people can take on actions. That's mainly mechanics for me because mechanics are very important. And sometimes you don't, you're you just a DM. You don't have everything. And the, the players expect you to know every little detail about every mechanic in the game. And so they'll ask you a question and you're, you're already thinking about the next five moves that your creature's going to be doing. You're trying to get into the headspace of your, your big, bad, evil guy, your BBG. And your player asks you a, a very you know, innocuous question about what they can do in their action. And you're thinking, I have, uh, oh, let me check my DM screen. It says exactly what the dodge action does. It says exactly what, what this action does, that type of stuff. Uh, and we'll probably include that into our DM binder uh, video that we're going to be making sometime soon. Uh, I could also see improv DMs using flowcharts to say, all right, so you're, you know, if this happens, it goes to here. If this happens, it goes to here. That might be a little harder in homebrew adventures, but for example, like Call of the Nether Deep could be really fun to have a flow chart because there's a lot of different directions that adventure can go. Um, there are some templates that can help you with some of these things online. Um, I don't use any of them because I, like I said, I, I use that one note template that really helped me out a lot, but there's some if you want to do physical notes, I'm sure you can find some some wonderful uh, like uh, binders and notebooks and stuff that focus specifically on DM adventuring notes, that type of stuff. There are also definitely ones for players. Um, you could have binders that have pages for specific arcs you can pull out and they could be kind of cool. Like you have a full, full bookshelf of different arcs of your campaign. I might actually start doing that. Now that I think about it. Um, and finally, I think it's important to think like what's important to you as notes. Like I said, that's the, that's the core. That's the crux of this important episode. Uh, this this dungeon crawl short, if I had to say something about it. Um, find out what organization works best for you, what's important to your notes. Um, I like having pictures on, on my notes. I'm a very visual type person. Sometimes it's hard for me to write down exactly the description, unless I'm spending a lot of time. So I, I like writing stuff, and so if I spend time, if I can write a cool description, but sometimes we don't have that time. So maybe it's faster to go to like a place like Art Station, or maybe you're playing a video game, you found a, a location you really like. But it's like describing a sunset. How do I describe the starting zone of Elden Ring? <laughs> but I don't know. So you just take a picture of it, put it on, on your screen, or put it on your, your notes somewhere, and you can use that as a, a way to begin to describe what the players are seeing. So they're seeing trees over to the left. They're seeing a campfire in front of them. There's a, a guy standing in front of it, and he's like cooking a, a marshmallow or something. To the right, you see some guy running on horseback up and down, like he's patrolling the area, and there's... Up to the top left is a gigantic castle on top of the mountaintop. Something like that, you know? Um, also, I like putting maps on here. Like I said before, maps are can be annoying when you're running a pre-run adventure because they have the map on the first page and then they have all the descriptions way after that. They don't ever show you the map again. So if you're trying to see what M3, how M3 gets to M6, have a map close on hand. Even if you're running like all physical stuff, print off that map somewhere. Some adventures nowadays will include a map that you can pull out and you can see on your own. They'll even include player maps sometimes so you can kind of like crawl through and see what it looks like. Um, and then also think about accessibility. How easy is it for you to transport these notes and how practical is it to use them in game? For example, OneNote, like I said, use OneNote. It's great when I'm using my, my laptop, but using it on at least visually using it on my iPad, which I would love to use for the games because it's a little easier for me to, to run and use, uh, is a little cumbersome and it's tougher for me to maneuver it around. Uh, so think about how practical is it for you to use? Because if it is, is it, is it easier for you to scroll through a gigantic PDF of your book or take the book and scroll through it one by one? If the answer for your notes is the, will take the same amount of time, you probably need to think of a more practical way to utilize your notes. Uh, formatting as well. <laughs> like I, formatting was my biggest problem with my first, with my paper notes, because you can't read a damn thing with those. And a lot of it comes down to my poor organization standards, but also my terrible handwriting at the time. So think about if you're putting it on a computer document or something online, think about text that will stand out well for your eyes, something that you can see easy, read off to your players if you need to, or just bullet points so you can quickly spot and get going. Um, 
Otherwise, if you're writing them down, use big popping colors, use some markers, maybe highlighters can be important. I've started highlighting all my OneNote as well to make sure I'm focusing on what I need to focus on. And finally, like I said before, find out what's important to you. I think it's it's more than okay to do trial and error. I, like I wouldn't have learned what works for me if I didn't learn what doesn't work for me first. I found out that writing everything down, that doesn't work well. It wastes a lot of time. I have even gone through multiple iterations of how I even organize my notes on my OneNote document. So if you go back to my old stuff, to my stuff that I ran yesterday, ran a big boss encounter last night. Uh, they're organized very differently. They're still, like I said, pretty messy, pretty randomized, but it, it fits. It works for my noggin. It works for my brain. And that's what's important. Because I'm sure if, if Braxton were to come and try to run something from my OneNote document, he would be flabbergasted that I can run anything looking at that. Uh, but if I were to give that, if I were to try to, you know, make it different for someone else, then I would obviously organize and change some, some things around. So I don't envy the people that make the the uh, adventures, the pre-run adventures for us, for D&D and WotC and whatnot and Pathfinder. Because that's a tough job to choose an organizational pattern that works for everybody or for the most amount of people. I think that's about it. You know, this is going to be a short bite-sized episode. Uh, it's tough to even call it a dungeon crawl because there's only one of the crawlers here. It, it's tough to crawl in a dungeon by yourself. Um, but if you want to join some other people to crawl with, hop in our Discord, please. We have a link tree down below. And you can hop in, tell me how you write your notes, or hell, comment on YouTube down below. Tell me how you run your notes or how you write your notes if you're a DM. I'm actually interested in how players do their notes too. I have a player in my home game who writes extensive notes and it's absolutely, it's very helpful for me, first of all, as a DM to, if I forgot something, to go back, look and read what they wrote and see what's important to them. But it's also interesting to see how everyone else organizes their stuff. We also have an email, thedungeoncrawlpod at gmail.com, a Twitter and Instagram at dungeoncrawlpod. We've been using Twitter more often. I'm trying to hop on there at least once or twice a day send out some tweets and, and talk to some people. There's some, some amazing content creators out there. Some people that I, I was blown away by someone that was doing minis, painting some minis. My God, my, I leave most of my minis naked in their pure gray form that they come to me in because I am so worried that I'm just going to screw it up painting it. And hey, maybe that's what I got to do. Trial and error. <laughs> I got to just practice it and do it. Um, also, uh, we have a, well, not we have, we have a, Apple podcast rate is five stars. I'm not going to do a whole little shtick because it's just a quick episode. You know, I could do a whole shtick where I, I pretend that something crazy happened to me and, and this story is definitely true and Braxton thinks it's true until about halfway through and he realizes what I'm doing and then yada, yada, yada. Um, we are going to be doing Nether Deep next week called Nether Deep. Oh, uh, Apple podcast rate is five stars, that type of stuff. Yeah, it's important. It helps out. Uh, we are doing Call the Nether Deep review next week. So if you have already run it, well, probably haven't finished it. That'd be, that'd be quite the feat. If you have already read it, um, don't do any spoilers, but comment down below. Tell me what you think of Call of the Nether Deep. I really enjoy it. That's all I'm going to say right now. I really, really enjoy it. I'm excited to see uh, what Braxton's thoughts are on it. Uh, so we'll talk about that next week. I'm very excited. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for crawling with me. I've, <laughs> I've been Ryan. He, he will be Braxton. And he is still Braxton, even though he's not feeling very well right now. So I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for sticking around. I appreciate you. See you then.